Welcome to Happy Homes and Garden. I'm your host. My name is Daphne Royce. I am a real estate broker, architecture, and interior designer. Have you ever wondered how the farm produce made it to store shelves? Especially in the snowy winter months, we still have fresh produce in the store shelves. Jack Holiday has been a produce buyer for over 30 years. He will share with us where all the produce from and how they made it to stores. Hi, Jack. Good afternoon, Daphne. How are you? Doing well. Excellent. Good to be here. Please tell us who you are and what is produce buyer. All right, Daphne. My name is Jack Holiday, and as you said with the introduction, I've been in the uh, produce business for over 30 years. Um, just a quick background. Actually, my initial interest in the business started after high school. I uh, took some time off between high school and college and was in Kenya, Africa for six months. And when I came back, I had a very altruistic thought or sense of purpose, and that would be to study agriculture to help those people in need and in impoverished nations. Well, it obviously morphed into something else, but after studying agriculture in college, I then uh, went into the produce business, uh, not as a first step. It was something that just sort of happened, morphed on its own by um, being in Los Angeles on a trip. And I noticed an industry, the wholesale produce market, busy at two in the morning. And I thought, this is fascinating. I don't know of another business that's like that. And then that led into my experience in the business. So a buyer, uh, that's as I started, I worked for Safeway stores as a buyer to begin with. And my job was to purchase those items that Safeway's regional buying offices were unable to buy. And I would buy those items off of what's called a terminal market or the wholesale market. So specifically in San Francisco, we have three wholesale markets. We have one in South San Francisco, and then we have one on Army Street or off of Army Street, San Francisco, and one in Oakland over in Jack London Square. So my job as a produce buyer was to uh, I'd have a buy list and I would walk the market as it's called in the mornings and see the various wholesalers to purchase those items I needed to fill the orders for Safeway, which were then shipped to Safeway's warehouse in uh, Los Angeles. So it created a very interesting dynamic in that as a buyer, everyone of course wants to sell you. And so you have this kind of a certain sense of um, friendship with these people since they wanna woo you into buying from them. But over time, you develop some very solid relationships, which are built on trust, and of course, the quality of the produce that you purchase and in turn deliver to the warehouse for Safeway. So that's how I started. So what do you buy? So um, currently, it's vegetables, and specifically, it's vegetables out of Mexico. And during the winter months, as we're in now, um, California is more or less dormant because of the cold weather. And certainly, as you mentioned in the introduction, the snow and the hard winter we've had. So that means we need to source produce from other countries and other regions. In this case, vegetables uh, coming out of central and southern Mexico. And that means that they're grown in Mexico, then they are shipped from the growing area to either um, uh, El Paso area, a Juarez a border, or which I'm more familiar with is out of Nogales, uh, Sonora, Mexico, crossing Nogales, Arizona. So that's the growing area that I purchased from and where it shipped to, and then there's additional steps from there. How many different hands from farmers before made it to stores? That's a very good question, Daphne. So let's, let's just talk out loud. So it would be the seed grower would be one, two would be the farmer, three would be the warehouse where the product is sorted, uh, the packing shed that's called. Then from there, it would go to a warehouse for storage. From there, it would go on a truck through a shipping point. Uh, from there, it would then go on a delivery truck to the actual market. And from there, the market uh, produce person would 
distributed on the stands for the consumers. So basically it's seven steps and there's probably a few more variations of that, but just generalizing it's about seven steps from seed to store. So some stores, for example, like Costco, they call themselves warehouse and Safeway, for example, is a supermarket. Is that shorter hands to Costco versus to Safeway? Well, I think it's it's interesting. I think from from if you're comparing the two, Costco is a much bigger entity company than Safeway because it's it's one of the largest. I mean, specifically in terms of wine purchasing, I think it's the largest purchaser of wine in the world. But um, so they have they being Costco, they have a lot of contract business that's done with specific shippers. Safeway may also have contract business, but being somewhat smaller, they will buy more on a short-term basis and not as much as a long-term basis in that Costco can warehouse longer time, more stores, and that's important to them to have those fixed prices, which are established by a contract, sometimes three months in advance. Where are our produce from during the winter months other than Mexico? Uh, Florida, uh, South America, Hawaii. Uh, this basically, it's, if you just would look at a, a, a map, geographically, it would be areas where it's warmer weather. So obviously you're not getting anything out of Wisconsin or the Midwest because it's frozen. So if Florida with warmer weather, you'd have a lot of citrus, tomatoes, um, some vegetables and certainly Mexico, um, warmer weather again, mostly vegetables. South America, uh, mangoes and some of the fruits, bananas and such. Is it difficult to have a produce transport cross borders? Very good question. That is, a, there's a lot of variables involved there. So just as a matter of steps, so a, a trucker will be contracted to pick up produce from a warehouse um, say it's crossed, or initially it's in Mexico. So it has to make it across the Mexican-US border by inspection, then it goes to a warehouse, then the trucker picks it up, and then he makes the long trek to his delivery points. And I actually, a lot of um, credit needs to go to the trucking industry because it's a, they're somewhat sort of the, the forgotten heroes in the sense that they are underappreciated and they're always doing an extremely tough job. And that's picking up the produce and making it to a delivery point on time. The variables being weather, traffic, accidents. Those things are all on the shoulders of the trucker. The customer is not always as conscious about those things. So when the truck arrives late, not by the trucker's uh, decision or choice, it's because of an accident or weather, he doesn't necessarily, the, the a customer doesn't have an understanding to that. So he's, he's late basically, and the customer gets upset. So the trucker has a lot of hard responsibility in terms of making the delivery. And those variables um, are, are something that are, are, you never know. It's, it's somewhat out of control, mother nature, weather, traffic, um, all those things are, 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 are difficult things to, to take into consideration when the trucker picks it up and makes a delivery. What happened if uh, our produce impacts, just like you said, by either disease or floods, maybe extreme weather? Are we just have empty shelves or there's some other things that we can fix? Very good this? questions. So um, it's, we all look at the weather, you, you hear the weather on the radio and you have some sense that, okay, today I need to wear a raincoat or a hat or a warm coat. It's going to be cold. It's going to be raining. Similarly, with produce um, brokers or salespeople and buyers and grocery stores, everyone is very conscious of the weather. So you have to be somewhat fortuitous, expecting or understanding if it's going to rain, you need to buy ahead. So you have an inventory to work from in case there's a major shortage and the harvest doesn't come in. The field, as you said, is flooded or there's a rainstorm or there's a hurricane, all those things take into consideration. So it's important to watch the weather and have very good communication between the shipper and the customer and also the produce manager to recognize he needs, in a case of shortages, 
to carry an extra in inventory. So he does not have empty shelves, as you mentioned. I have another question for you about what you just said. For example, for the weather, you can forecast what is coming. If there is some extreme weather is coming our way, sometimes the farmer will pick up their produce earlier than they scheduled to be. Would that create any over harvest at one time in a certain regions? It's a good question. So he will, as you said, speculating on uh, a severe storm coming and his produce may not be in the peak in terms of its ripeness, but it's better to harvest it than have nothing. So yes, and the short side, short part of the short answer is, yes, it will have, you'll have produce immediately, but that will create a delay in the next cycle because he won't have, he may have to strip all the, all the vines or the plant, and there might not then be a bloom that will create a, a new set afterwards. So that cycle, that next cycle may be damaged as a result of the early harvest. But were we able to replenish the next cycle with a different region? Yes, I think it's, it's interesting. It, you can have conditions sort of in a sense of microclimate. So in a, in a vast area of, I'll use an example in Mexico, their major growing area is called Hermosillo. So you can have actual microclimates within that major growing area. So one area may have been hurt by whitefly, which is a, a pest that basically sucks the juice out of the vine, and then that starves the fruit or the produce. And another field might not have any problem. So it can, it can have all sorts of variations of one area or one, one plot can have a problem, another could be fine and have a, a bountiful harvest. So it's, it's a, there's a lot of ebb and flow and, and, and microclimate conditions that exist. For the perfect scenario, how long it takes produce from farm to store and how to keep produce flash? Uh, farm to store, well, it depends on the, on the actual commodity or the produce, but an average is growing time would be 28 days or thereabouts. And then depending on the region, example being coming from Nogales, Arizona to the San Francisco Bay Area, that's typically a two to three day trip. So you're looking at an average of 30 to 35 days thereabouts from, from uh, harvest or, or growing harvest to delivery to the store. And for the most part, uh, your question in terms of keeping it fresh, those are all factors of when it's picked, the conditions that it's, it's refrigerated in, how it's delivered on the truck, if the trucker has a reefer, short for refrigeration, on his truck, and again, how it's stored at the store level, if it's all kept in refrigeration as well. And those are all constants or, or things that are, I should say, are adjusted accordingly because you have inspectors, you have people who are in the warehouse checking the maturity of certain things to know when it should be shipped. And the produce managers also look at the fruit, smell the fruit, taste the fruit, check its sugar level, determine if it's, if it's ripe and it's, it's appropriate for stocking on the shelves as well. How about transportation incidents? Just like you mentioned it, or any refrigeration didn't work? It's an issue and it's, it's something that comes up frequently. And of course you have insurance to safeguard against this. But um, oftentimes, if there is a, a load, as it's called, a full truck load of produce that the refrigeration has gone out on, and it delivers to its customer, and the customer receiving opens the doors and finds that the temperatures are out of alignment, they're too warm, generally the salesperson, or I should say the customer, will call the salesperson to say, we have a problem, Jack, what do we do? So generally you take an inspection, which means a federal inspector comes and he grades the damaged produce. And that generally gives you an indication how much it's out of grade and how much you need to adjust to the customer to make sure the customer has something salvageable. In some instances, an entire load can be lost, which means it then needs to be dumped, which means it typically then will be utilized to a feedlot or literally it'll go to a landfill, but that's a rarity. Wow, that can be a disaster. 
a costly disaster. Absolutely, you're right. Do you purchase any organic produce? I have, yes. That, that's certainly a, a market niche that is expanding and certainly it was concerns thinking about uh, what happened in Ohio with the train derailment and pesticides and uh, air quality and all these things. I think people are much more aware and conscious of what they consume. So the organic end of the produce um, purchasing or growth is an expanding market. The success of Whole Foods is a good example of that. Do they take a certain amount of time to make it to store on the farms? Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily take any longer. It's just that it's under different um, criteria in terms of how it's grown. Uh, another thing, it's a certain misnomer with organics. It doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have any um, uh, pesticides use. In some cases, they do use a pesticide, but it's just uh, not as strong. It's a different pesticide in general. So um, it doesn't mean it's absent of any, any um, man-made elements in its growth. Do you see the price point is higher? It is, because it does take more time and it, it, it is more expensive. Um, one thing that's interesting, oftentimes with organic, the appearance is not as uh, attractive as conventional. It might have some scarring on it. It might have some misshape, but uh, I think the consumers overlook that and will purchase organic at a higher price for the fact that they feel it is a healthier product. I heard that Washington State has the best pear, Texas has the best watermelon. Can you tell us which region produce best vegetables? Very tough question because I think it's it becomes sort of the judgment of uh, maybe the the buyer to say, well, I'm I'm proud to say that in um, Salinas, which is the the uh, Salinas is a very, very major part of, you know, the nation's agriculture. And that would be, I would say, the region that is best known for leaf items, all your lettuces. Uh, so that would be probably the best in the country there. Um, citrus, you could say California, as well as Florida. Uh, tomatoes, you would, could say certainly Mexico, California, and Florida. Um, in terms of vegetables in general, I would probably say that California, uh, being the predominant um, agricultural state in the country and also produce, that it would probably rank as number one from a uh, taste standpoint, if that's the, um, the criteria. I heard Selena's has some hydro products. What I meant is uh, they don't use soil to produce produce. So it's called hydroponics. What that means is that it's, it is in a water bath. You have a root system that's in a water bath. And that is constantly, the water is moving. So it's, it's purified and uh, the, ro the roots are, are fed nourishment, but the, they don't need a soil. It, it will have, oftentimes it'll have like a sponge, which the roots then can uh, adhere to, but the water is, there, is the equivalent of soil. It's typically a closed environment in a greenhouse, so it doesn't have all the variables of the wind and weather outside. So it's a controlled atmosphere in effect. But it's, a, it's another uh, uh, niche of the produce industry. It's very expensive, um, so it doesn't have as big a market share because it's much more costly. Would the nutrition are the same compared to the ordinary? I think um, so. I think right. hydroponics to conventional, I would say, yes, I think the, the nutritional values would be the same. Yes. So I find certain stores has better produce, but with the much higher prices. Are all the supermarkets have a same source of their products? I think it's interesting. You look at uh, markets will be regional. You'll have the higher end markets, as we mentioned earlier, Whole Foods. And then you will have small regional stores or what are called mom and pop stores, which will be in a neighborhood. Obviously, the small neighborhood store doesn't have the economic buying power that Whole Foods has. So they will be more conscious in their costs and their quality may not be as good as Whole Foods. 
but then again, their prices that they sell to the customers are less. So there's your certain trade-off. You can find tomatoes, Roma tomatoes, which are the um, sort of teardropped or, or oval-shaped small tomato, which is very popular in the Hispanic world uh, customers. You'll find those at the small regional stores, basically the same quality for oftentimes 20 and 30% less than you will at the large retail markets as a Safeway or a Lucky's or a Whole Foods. Here's what I, could, I, I think that's interesting is um, the industry, the produce industry in general is an industry that doesn't have any contracts. The negotiation is done over the telephone. It's based on trust. So I'll use you, Daphne, as an example. I'm buying produce from you. You have Daphne Enterprises and I have holiday uh, produce. We've developed over the years a rapport over the telephone. I've trusted your quality. It's been fairly priced. I've paid you in a timely manner. And it's what's unique about the produce business is that you build a trust and I can buy from Daphne Enterprises a load of produce. The contract is the verbal conversation we have over the phone. The price is established. I figure out the trucking. I deliver it and I pay you. There's nothing written. You being in the real estate business, you have all sorts of legalese and documentations that you have to sign. And in the case of the produce business where you're loading a truck that could be valued at $5,000 up to $150,000, depending on the commodity. And there's no contract. It's just done over the phone. And that's amazing. It's unique in the sense that here we live in a world which is highly automated, very contractual. And here's something that's very old school and built on more or less a, a verbal handshake. And that is what consummates and keeps the, the deal together. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of refreshing. It's very old school and uh, in a world and certainly in the Bay Area where high tech and things are so advanced, it's a, it's a refreshing change. Is that only happen in maybe Midwest or something somewhere very remote? They need the produce coming to the area and they don't really have a regular buyer that locally so that you have to use this method? No, I think I think since the telephone can be any can be anywhere, remote or a city, um, no, I don't think it's I don't think that it's it's limited. I think that it's just that's the um, the nature of the business, and it's all, it really hasn't changed, and it's it's a wonderful thing. It's it's built on a trust, it's built on on um, reputation, and and that's how everyone does business. It's over the telephone. I mean, you will have certainly there are you have a PO number, which is the confirmation of the order, so you know it's a good order, and you deliver it with that PO number. That's the that in a sense is a contract, but it's. There's nothing written before the deal is consummated or put together. It's just done over the telephone. So it's, it's unique. No internet, no uh, emails. <laughs> oh, well, certainly there's email and there's internet, but the, 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 um, the telephone is what, what is the, is the, uh, what, what, what starts it and closes it, closes the contract. Were you foreseeing in the future that we will do more electronic way to make it transactions differently? Well, I think what where where the real um, technology is coming um, is with robotics, and that's in the harvest end of it. Because what all uh, everyone struggles with is labor, and the the migrant workers obviously are moving from growing area to growing area. And there's obviously much concern about them being under, underpaid, not getting proper attention to uh, their health and such. So having robotics eliminates that element and harvests uh, the fields without human hands. And uh, it's a whole science that's uh, becoming, it's expensive certainly, but it is becoming much more uh, prevalent in um, what's on in apples in Washington um, because apple is, is fairly solid so it can take um, a certain jostling around and a robotic machine can come into the field 
where there are rows of trees and harvest the apples off the tree rather than having someone hand pick it. So it's it's a it's a it's a savings to the ultimately not initially because the 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 uh, machinery is very expensive, but over time it is a benefit to the grower and it'll save him money and saves him time. I do have a couple questions for you. First, I'd like to know why certain produce will have on sale like weekly. They have weekly special. Why do they do that? It's to it's to uh, it's a, to incentivize the customer. The two departments in any given produce or market, I should say, where they make the most money is produce and the meat department. It's not the canned goods. It's not the shampoo or the dry goods. It's produce and meat. So having a special, which typically they do it, it's it's a seasonal seasonal item, which is reflective of the time of year, be it a fruit or a vegetable, and that will draw customers in. And uh, it's the the markets typically do it on the same cycle every year. So come you think of Easter, Easter strawberries and asparagus are very popular. Um, you get into the uh, get into April, it begins to be cherries, and then we get into the summer, it's more fruit. So each uh, buyer or store uh, market will advertise those items that are um, timely for the season. My second question to you is, why can the stores, for example, like a Safeway, can they just have a send water for some period of time. For example, they can have, we want a truck load of apples and they just get apple every week. Why are they not able to do that? Oh, well, um, certainly it's it, on an apple, you, it, I mean, it has a season, so it's harvested. And then um, they'll put those apples in storage. So to, to your point, they'll have, you know, certainly a lot of varieties of apples, but I'll just use a Macintosh as a as a variety. And um, the store will want Macintosh when they're not normally harvested. That means that the shipper needs to find those apples in the storage to deliver, even though it may be out of the seasonal period. So on apples, you can have apples year round. You can have grapes for the most part year round, but on more perishable items like figs, which are very, very perishable, you really can't store them to have them in December. It's something that's in late summer months that you'll be able to have. Them. So some items, to answer your question a little more clearly or thoroughly, some items as in apples, you can have year round and other items because of their um, delicateness, you can only have seasonally. Wow. Ah. That makes total sense now. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Jack. I really appreciate it. This is sound like a very interesting business and it's a lot of layers and complications beyond what I was thinking from farm, just to have somebody just driving the truck to the store, but it sounds like more complicated. Well, I, thank you. You're, I, you're good questions, good interview. I, I hope it will and enlighten your audience and give them a little more perspective of what the, the produce industry is about other than just going to the market and uh, figuring that feeling that the cost was too much. <laughs> well, that was very informative. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you. Bye-bye.